jsou tady takový trošku jako... Tak to jsou ty slidy věci. Tam je tak. timing, tak to je dobrý. Tam je, tam je timing, ale minulé mi ho nezapli, takže... No. Tady máš laser, dopředu, dozadu. Jo. No. One of my friends got married in med school. We had like no money, and so um, or your place, you have a seat. Or no, I'd rather sit at the table.
Okay, so we'll probably get started in about a minute. If you can have a seat. Okay, thank you so much. Um, welcome to our second plenary session. Uh, today we're talking about efficiency in guideline development. Um, I'm Nancy Santesso. I'm uh, moderating the session along with my colleague. Um, I'm from McMaster University in Canada and um, associate professor there. And uh, Miloslav? Did you... yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Miloslav Klugar. I'm from Czech Republic. Uh, leading the Czech Cochrane GBI Great Centers and a head of the National Guideline Methodology Program. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have such excellent speakers here. And I think we should start. So, Nancy. Sure. Great. Um, so, our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Nicola Magrini, and he's going to uh, speak about uh, gigantic guidelines. Um, and uh, he's a medical doctor, specialty in clinical pharmacology, a 20 years experience in drug evaluation, evidence synthesis, guideline development, and pharmaceutical policies. Um, he was the director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Evidence-Based Research Synthesis and Guideline Development, and a scientist at WHO Geneva as the secretary for the Essential Medicines List. Um, and currently, Director General in the Italian Medicines Agency. So, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you all. Thank you, Holger. Thank you, organizer, for inviting me also from this new role. I'm still very affectionate to this um, world of guideline uh, making and disseminating and implementing. Um, so, uh, with this long title, uh, we thought it could be good to think what we learned in the past two very tough years and um, from that experience probably reasoning together whether we are achieving what, all what we can through this uh, important production of guidelines. So of course I have no conflict. Um, I, I, I'll try to let you understand why the perspective of a regulator is different, what, what's our agency in Italy is looking like, it's quite an atypical one, similar to the one in Norway and Portugal, summing up multiple functions. And um, what have we learned in the last 25 years of guidelines production? Some example of moving into, into colors, let's put it this way, regulators tend to be black and white, dull documents, pretty long, that's why going from gigantic guidelines to sh short and clear recommendations has been, at least for us, a big step in, in the last few months. Um, and, and some conclusions. So, wh what is our agency? In Europe, there is a European agency we are part of, which approves drugs or medicines on a one-by-one -one basis based on the benefit-risk ratio. Um, the agency I'm now chairing has to deal once drugs are approved at European level to define the place in therapy, optimal uses, reimbursement, yes or no, uh, from a national health service that is universal and uh, gives all medicines free of charge. Um, and plus the pricing that is within our agencies. So we need to have more comparative evaluations and uh, also define optimal uses. But we also add um, um, an independent research funding coming from a law for which 5% of industry spending on marketing, including Congresses, is devoted to our agency to support independent comparative research. And um, probably something we have not developed enough is in, an information um, independent information with the national health system, which is something I think we all should invest on, together with guidelines. And finally, we monitor medicine use for the national health system. So it's a deeply rooted uh, agency uh, supporting the national health system also on drug use and spending. 
Um, so the idea of uh, are the best guidelines we produce probably becoming too large? I take this wonderful example of 10 years ago of the antithrombotic therapy and quoting my friend Gordon Guy and Holger, um, they were thinking that this huge effort, um, absolutely spectacular in terms of, of, of methodology, was probably with 600 recommendations in 1,000 pages becoming a bit, a bit voluminous to, to handle from um, average man or prescriber perspective. And it was them saying probably uh, is, is, becoming, is becoming too big. Um, um, taking another good standard of uh, guidelines, the European level uh, um, heart guidelines, this is atrial fibrillation, it's again 130 pages with a table of contents running for two or three pages. So um, how to pick the more, the more uh, tricky recommendation or the more important factor we want to change, not easy. So um, to joke a bit at the BMJ, they used to say, um, please don't write it too long uh, or uh, it means you, 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 you didn't have much time if you wrote it so long. Um, so why short is better? Um, Ten years ago and more, a couple of colleagues I uh, truly appreciate, Lisa Schwarz who passed away and Stephen Voloshin, suggested um, a, a fact sheet of a page out of the voluminous uh, FDA report in which there should have been the, the main results summarized um, mostly in absolute term, possibly NNT, uh, avoiding relative uh, r risk reductions. Um, um, I think that's a good starting point. Another big step forward in my view are the recent New England Journal of Medicine summaries whereby with some graphics they tend to show the main results um, at, at, at a glance. Um, I think it's important. Um, also this kind of uh, overviews, um, in 30 seconds probably you have a fairly good idea. I think and I thank the New England for this investment. Um, I say it explicitly, there are a couple of friends here also in the Canadian Medical Association Journal that could, for some competition, try to, to do better. Uh, journals uh, suffer or like competition. Um, the summary of findings table, I think they are perfect in, in methodology. You have all the information there for all the outcomes considered. Um, for an average expert reader, there is everything to calculate whatever we like. But still, going into uh, determining the NNT or the natural frequencies, what's the actual absolute benefit, requires some some little work, it's not perfectly intuitive yet. So I, I would encourage to, 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 do, to do a little bit more in, in moving from these researchers' tool into something for the general public. So going back 20 years almost, um, and remembering David Sackett and Doug Altman, uh, there was a discussion on why we have this problem. This problem comes because researchers here, uh, prefer relative measure, fairly stable across uh, different baseline risks, whereas clinical decisions, including decision maker and policy makers, need absolute measures. Um, and also citizen um, and policy maker and politicians need that, so there is a split between how the researcher speaks and how the politician either listen or understand. And so uh, they determined that uh, we always need three things that often do not appear, which is the context and the baseline risk that during COVID was so important to measure the number of cases per week to determine where we were. The actual result, for example, of from 10 to 8% reduction in mortality is a 20% relative, but is a 2% absolute, generating an NNT of 50, or um, a benefit of two lives every 100 patients or 20 lives every 1,000, going back to summary of findings table. 
So the implication, is it worth doing it, would require some knowledge on, on the risks and the costs. This information is far from being shared, usually, and very often, typically in press release of the companies, we don't understand exactly what was the baseline risk and what are the implications. Um, so what we tried to do with some difficulties after the first three months, uh, 2020, during COVID, was um, using some colors, uh, basically the traffic light, with some true embarrassment at the beginning. Should we truly use this to communicate our important decisions? And, and yes, so we started with the hospital management recommendations and the idea that the three pillars, steroid, low molecular weight heparin, um, and um, oxygen were green lighted, uh, was, was easy. What was more difficult was to specify on when to use the selected patient for, for optimal use of some monoclonals and remdesivir too, depending on, on, on the phase of the disease and so forth. And probably the most important thing I think we achieved with the traffic light recommendation was when we were saying no. So no to antibiotics, uh, especially azithromycin, no to HIV drugs at the very beginning, and, um, and probably this uh, uh, recommendation against um, coupled with the non-reimbursement um, was somehow clear, though, um, though overuse remained, and this is something I would like to share, so it's not a full success, but was a long discussion within the agency and with the committees, should we speak this kind of language easy to read? And, uh, and the same was for the home treatment that came on a second phase. And uh, similarly, we listed against the uh, antibiotic and azithromycin, recommending why not, um, very clearly. And some discussion, are you sure, it should be never, what about precaution and prevention and so forth. Prevention of what, I don't know. Um, so um, we, we remain with this. Of course, hydroxychloroquine was an easy game to say no, though this was highly polarized in terms of politics in Italy too. So an interesting game we all played. Um, uh, it was not an easy one. So again, um, how to use paracetamol and uh, non-steroidal for, for the symptoms and how to use only in selected patients the antivirals or the monoclonals was something uh, new for, for our agency. And, uh, and this is the timing of 2020, for example, when, as you can see at the very beginning, even drugs for which in two, three months we started saying no, were either green or yellow, and then became clear no as the evidence accumulated. Um, um, yeah, that was the most difficult year, 2020 especially until December then the vaccine came and it was all much easier. We presented these um, this, uh, difficulties in the definition of a standard treatment for the clinical trials, coupled with uh, the need to have less research, less trial, larger in dimension as something we should be able to promote and that again was not easy. We had a huge fragmentation of research. We approved, we approved um, almost 75 studies in Italy out of 200 requests, so 70% 70, 70 rejection rate, but still too high. So again, to share with you, with this group, uh, some reflection. More than 20 years ago, actually 25, when we started the ABM courses with Alessandro Liberati, that many of you here know, we were probably more mature in thinking of the difficulties. So let me share with you the idea that what we have been learning with ABM is also the complexity. And that variability is not just a matter of uh, knowledge or knowledge sharing. So dissemination could solve the problem. The simple dissemination, um, even of good quality, does not change clinical practice. And the 
implementation is a hugely complex uh, thing uh, for which uh, uh, generalizability issues are also at stake. Um, so I think that during COVID we forgot the, these difficulties and ran into somehow a problem uh, when we uh, were surprised that doctors were not following our, our recommendations. So um, to conclude, um, we need more comparative research and more um, independent research to confirm the validity of new medicines. Um, at the very beginning, I thanked Jerry Avon from, from Harvard uh, when very early in April 2020, saying that uh, um, issues such inadequate trial design, overreaching public declaration, widespread use of unproven treatment will continue to be present during the pandemic, true. Saying that in April was quite helpful. And the rigorous uh, methodology we all know of uh, uh, not only randomized trial, but adaptive uh, randomized trial has become, um, if not the norm, something to aim at, at all level in all countries. And uh, these are the two major platforms, Solidarity, WHO, and Recovery Trial, that both uh, um, were able to give us the most uh, um, timely no for, 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 for solidarity. It was solidarity to say no to chloroquine, to HIV drugs and interferon, and recovery was the one saying yes to uh, desametazone. Um, we, um, we at IFA decided to fund some comparative trial, and I want to share with you that we, we supported, um, with little money, just a few million, four in independent RCTs, one of which was, was running well in the platform of solidarity. So again, out of four trials, only one provided good results. So the idea would have been, why not merging these four? Why, why four? But um, the comparison of the available monoclonals, three of them during the first wave, showed that all the monoclonals were not equal. One was clearly inferior. Um, and when the, when the information became available, it was already too late and the wave had been superseded by the new Omicron BA5 variant, for which now the same study is providing some very reassuring results on the two available monoclonals comparing with Paxlovid um, very well the three. So, um, so as a regulator, I'd like to share the fact that many um, approved drugs lack the information needed for well-informed choices. And if that information is not there, we should support its generation. Um, the ecosystem, this is a thank to my friend Olga, but also other from WHO, Lorenzo, that recently published this um, good paper, in my view, with a spectacular uh, graph um, that I here reproduce in detail. Um, the perfect animation is clearly from Holger, would never be able to do this. But um, uh, is, um, however, after this uh, congratulations, I, I'd like to show why I'm doing all this. Um, because there are also the regulators, that is my new role. And I think, uh, sorry Holger, we are a bit too low in, in the line. So I'm proposing the regulators to be, to be moved up. Um, a little bit, and um, also include the fact that we often have to consider unpublished evidence that a regulatory level is uh, important, and um, also the coverage decision, as you can see, should not stay down there but could come together, and so um, the coverage should be together with HTA, at least where these things happen in the same agency, like, for example, in Italy. But the idea of the ecosystem is very important. Also this morning, the three very interesting lecture 
somehow drove our attention to be part of an ecosystem. So the clinical research, clinical trial and publication, in my view, are already a quite, uh, a quite uh, self-conscious ecosystem, whereas the guidelines come a little bit too late, often, and the information we need is um, often perceived as a non-priority, and from my new position, I think it should become a priority for us all. Finally, the medical education, congresses, workshops, events should be part of this, and probably it is not. So, in green, I think is fairly okay. Publication, protocol, publications, outcome reporting bias, we are all well aware of that and try to find solutions for it. The guideline, yes, but look for better format and more timely, when possible, concentration on the important controversial issues and the medical part on the medical education should be part of this ecosystem and is probably now a bit too much left aside. To conclude, I think that COVID-19, two very difficult years, have strengthened the role of uh, and the reliability of randomized trial, including the adaptive that can be considered also for regulators, um, that was not thinkable years ago. And also the role of real-world evidence um, has been confirm confirmatory of, of, of this evidence. And comparative research is absolutely essential, and essential is a very important word for, for one coming from WHO like me. So let us reflect on we defining a common code of communicating absolute differences, baseline risks in a proper way, and maybe together with, w, with, with guidelines, more friendly format. Um, hoping that this could make us all part of a common ecosystem on which um, I truly believe. In the end, we are all responsible for all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think similar to this morning, if we have, uh, we probably have time for a couple questions that might be specific, um, or we can leave it to the end. It's up to you if we have any other specific questions. Very good. Okay. Um, Milosov, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Very good. So then for the specific questions, you know, there are the microphones, yeah? So you can just find them over there and come to them. And I see we have one question in the meantime. Okay, excellent. So please introduce yourself and... Yeah. Uh, Danilo Di Bona from Italy. Uh, um, the question is, uh, was there any evidence of discrepancies between result of uh, randomized controlled trial and real world evidence? And uh, what is the uh, weight that uh, agency uh, uh, gave to uh, um, uh, real world evidence? So, um, I, I mostly refer to the confirmation of real-world evidence, especially for vaccines, that was comforting. If there is a contrast, I, I think uh, there were not cases where this was driven to the decision-maker uh, attention. And um, I, I think uh, they how to say, good sophistication or good methodology now for some of these observational research on real world evidences, replicating pretty well um, comparison of groups that look alike. And, and um, I, I have to say real world evidence has proven very useful for uh, detecting signal in, in safety in particular. And, um, but still the order cannot be changed. Let's stick to randomized first, and, and then what can be added, especially for safety, has been very important. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. For, uh, so for the next question, it will be for a general discussion. And now it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome and invite to the podium uh, Dr. Vladim Lichenik, uh, who is assistant uh, professor in the Czech National Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare Knowledge Translation member of the uh, Czech-Ukraine GBI 
uh, great centers, uh, but also working as a clinician, as a consultant in stroke medicine, specializing in general internal medicine and neurology uh, within the uh, London Neurology Clinic, uh, um, which is part of the Northwest Anglia NHS Funded Trust. So, Radim, uh, there is a lot of things I can tell about you, but uh, uh, I think you can uh, come to podium and introduce um, your, your lecture. Maybe to say that Radim is around the guidelines since 2004 uh, already, and he's uh, one of the first who started to speak about guidelines and uh, robust guidelines methodologies in, in the Czech Republic. So, Radim, the stage is yours. Thank you, Miroslav. Thank you for in inviting me this afternoon, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm not a living history of guidelines development around the world, but <laughs> I do remember lots of, lots of things. Uh, uh, also, uh, the title, Sing Three Nails in One Hit, doesn't mean I'm aggressive. In <clears throat> uh, but it's, it's related to efficiency in guideline, uh, guideline development. This is our mantra. Uh, we should aim to adopt, adapt, and adopt. Uh, existing guidelines, and then we can hit um, the nails. So I'm normally I'm a stroke physician, as you can see. Uh, I'm focused on emergency stroke, stroke care, which is which is my main field, uh, and I'm also guidelines methodologist and developer historian. Uh, <clears throat> so from my clinical practice, um, stroke is an emergency. So it's because I've been doing it for for a long time, uh, every day, so it's somewhere inside, and I'm using these these emergency approaches to um, to the other fields. Um, this is the main main thing in stroke medicine: is uh, time is brain, because every every single second counts, and you can usually make one mistake, um, and then it's a disaster. So we need to be very very efficient, fast, and try not to do any mistakes or errors. Uh, this is the other thing which we, oh, most of us, we don't like uh, re reinventing the wheel. Um, so it's no, 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 not again. This is my daughter. <coughs> so why, why, why to sing three nails in, in one hit? Uh, initially I was thinking, so doing, basically doing, doing a lot of things at the same time. Uh, and with very good outcomes, so you can you can deliver lots of things by using using other. Um, so I was thinking uh, we can say okay, kill two flies or with one hit or or three or nine. It depends where you are from. Uh, if you are from Prague, you can you can uh, hit one um, two flies. You can kill two flies. If you are from further east, you can hit three or nine. If you are in the, from the mountains, uh, or uh, English equivalent, you can kill two birds with one, uh, one stone. And then I thought, okay, fine, 2021, it's really aggressive. Uh, so this is something I would use 30 years ago, uh, fine. But now we are softer, we don't kill things, we don't kill animals, we are very friendly to every, every, everything and everybody and everyone. So uh, I thought, okay, fine, I need to get some other title like efficiency is excellent or amazing or something. Uh, <clears throat> and then, oh, then I, I, I've realized uh, the word has not changed because we are still aggressive. So this Russian invasion brought us back to the beginning of the 20th century, unfortunately. Um, but then uh, I've realized, okay, I was, I was just, uh, I was moving my house, I told Nicola. Uh, and I was just dismantling the beds, and I realized, okay, fine, I can, I can sing three nails with one head. So it's not aggressive, I'm not killing anybody, so it's fine. So, <clears throat> and you can use very sophisticated tools, you don't need to use only hammer, you've got some um, artificial intelligence in it, and you can, you can make it better if you, if you, if you just make some um, error. So in globalized world, uh, world, we can we can really do uh, all these things, hitting, uh, sinking three nails, thanks to Jen. So mantra, adopt, adopt, adopt. So don't waste resources and don't waste time. So I'll show you some examples what we what we've done in in Czechia or Czech Republic, uh, within the Czech National Guidelines Development Development Program. 
Uh, Czech Republic is, um, is a nice country in Central Europe uh, full of historical buildings and very good emergency services, so you don't need to be worried to, uh, to come in to 2024, hopefully, fingers crossed, to Prague for Global Evidence Summit. We've got helicopters, we've got ambulances, so you will be very safe. <laughs> so it's somewhere, somewhere there in Central, Central Europe. So in the past, as in, in all the other countries around the world, we were developing guidelines, thousands and thousands, just we, we, were, we were calling them guidelines, but they were really something which, which you wouldn't call guidelines nowadays. Uh, usually some, someone was sitting on a train writing something, then when the train was approaching, I said, okay, I've got something, and it's, it's a guideline, let's use it. And, Method, methodology wise it was just a random selection or a mushroom picking picking style so it's it's our national sport we are going to the forests in, in uh, autumn and, and summer picking some mushrooms or simple translation from one language to another one um, inspiration from somewhere so somebody liked something just pick it up and put it as I say oh it's a, it's a good guideline so let's let's follow it so it's a again big no 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 nowadays uh, we've got a lot of tools, um, a lot of, lots of instruments, we've got a lot of institutions, we've got a lot of collaboration we can use, and this Global Evidence Summit just illustrates what we can do. So we need to move on from, from the past to the future, precision medicine. Hmm. But we do appreciate some, some people doesn't want to move, they want to stay uh, <coughs> with no evolution at all, so fine, it's, they feel safe. Uh, so mantra again, adopt, adapt, adopt. So we've uh, started the Czech National Guidelines Development Program in 2018. It was funded by uh, European Union and Czech, Czech government, uh, managed by um, Ministry of Health and Czech Research Council. And the guidelines methodology was developed by uh, our center, the Miloslav is the director, which is the umbrella for Czech Cochrane uh, GBI and great centers. Uh, everything is publicly, publicly available, all the methodologies, so everybody can see it. This is, this is in Czech language. So lots of educational training sessions, opportunities, and, and e-learning things. So when we started in 2018, uh, we had just five pilot guidelines. We were just learning, implementing how to do it, and now, nowadays we've got 52 guidelines. Adopt, adapt, and adolop. Again, the mantra. So I'll show you two examples uh, how we were developing the guidelines. Uh, we were very lucky in, uh, back in 2018 uh, in stroke medicine, uh, because there was already a stroke foundation, Aust Australian stroke foundation. They were using very, very strictly great methodology to develop their stroke guidelines. Uh, they were using uh, magic up, uh, so everything was there. So we could easily just, uh, just go and take it. Um, their guidelines in Australia are also, also living guidelines for stroke management, so, which is perfect. So, so they used great, everything goes there very strictly, very precisely, now it's, it's living guidelines. Um, yes, uh, we are in the north, Australia is in the south. Uh, our countryside is a little bit different. Uh, we've got very nice uh, and friendly reptiles and, and, uh, and frogs, so nothing poisonous. However, aspirin is aspirin, so we could easily just adopt what, what they do. Uh, aspirin, how to say aspirin in, in Italian? Aspirina? Mm. Or aspirin? So aspirin is everywhere. The living guidelines were, uh, are covering <coughs> all spectrum of stroke medicine, from pre-hospital care to acute medicine, rehabilitation, community care, so it was very, very good, uh, very good cover. Uh, the living guidelines methodology was perfect, so we, we've established very good cooperation and friendship. We joined their team, so we are working on the guidelines, guidelines development uh, together. Uh, there's a lots of, lots of updated uh, guidelines. So from 2018-2022, uh, we've just uh, we've decided to focus on secondary prevention. We picked up some, some topics there, and we've developed a couple of, couple of guidelines. Um, so Amazing. Uh, example number two, 
and I'll show you later on what, what we did more. Uh, adaptation of uh, autism spectrum disorder guidelines uh, for, uh, for children. Uh, we've decided to, to adopt or adapt uh, NICE guidelines from the UK. Uh, very extensive, extensive guidelines, hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, compared to the Australian very, Australian, very short guidelines. So we've, uh, we've used two. Uh, the first one was for diagnosis mostly, and the second one for management. And this is the, the, the result. Uh, the only issue with the NICE guidelines were, because um, the recommendations are uh, recommendations with no, uh, no grade graphics, so the grading wasn't sort of graphically uh, as we have in the in the national uh, in the national national uh, methodology. So this is the example of one of the nice uh, recommendations. So then, not only for nice, but um, for the other uh, institutions we were adopting uh, or adapting or adopting the guidelines. We've developed the visual transformation of the of the guidelines presentations of the strength of recommendation and certainty of evidence. Uh, so just to harmonize it. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was the, the classic, classic grade. So then we need to uh, transform the grading system from different, uh, different institutions to strength of recommendations into grade. And same with the, with the evidence. So the levels of evidence, uh, we need to transform it to um, certainty of evidence in, in grade. So this is the, the sort of guidance, the tool. Uh, we did it for, for lots, of, lots of institutions, uh, about 12. We were using their, their uh, guidelines. NICE was one of them. So taking this, this recommendation, so we just um, transform. We, we had to go back to the uh, table of evidence and all the, all the processes and then transform it. Um, to the certainty of evidence and strength of recommendation according to, um, uh, to grade, and this is the result. So every, every, every um, recommendation is the same. Uh, luckily, with the guidelines from Australia, everything was there, so strong recommendation uh, with the research evidence in the background, certainty of evidence high, whatever, it was there. So we could just, just take it, and we, we didn't need to transfer, trans, uh, transform anything, so it was done. Uh, the only problem we had with the um, cholesterol lowering therapy, because when we are doing the secondary prevention, so uh, cardiologist in our panel suggested to uh, to have some recommendation from uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines. Um, so we've decided to, or we had a consensus. We are going for development, so we'll take the the recommendation from from there. Um, but again, we had to transform it. So it's all, it's about uh, statins and uh, lower target for LDL cholesterol, which is more, which is lower in the European Society of Cardiology. They are more aggressive than the stroke physicians. Uh, as you can see, the, the level of evidence and certain, uh, and the recommendation, strength of recommendation was different, so we had to transform it. But because we had already the tool, it was very easy to do it. So we did it into grade. So all our recommendations are in, in grade. Shared decision-making tools, adaptation, again, uh, very lucky with the stroke, stroke uh, guidelines from Australia uh, because they have, these, uh, they have these tables in, in the application, so very easy, to, very easy to use. Come on, try again. Uh, so we can, we can develop uh, guidelines on the international, national level with all the cooperation, uh, collaboration worldwide, but then we need to hit one of the nails um, and sink it. <laughs> uh, so we need to implement the clinical practice guidelines into the clinical, clinical practice. And this is what we are doing in, in my, my trust, in my hospitals. Um, we started doing the uh, special teaching and advanced stroke for the doctors and nurses, it's multidisciplinary, uh, other healthcare professionals. So it's hybrid, face-to-face uh, -face and MS team, so everybody can join it uh, every Tuesday. Uh, there are outcomes, so everything is established and predictable. Uh, one part is focused on uh, the stroke management, 
so what shall we do? So it's all about guidelines, so what guidelines are recommending. Uh, so we want to do the right thing. The other part is focused on the, on the science, less, a little bit. Um, so what shall we do? So we are just talking about evidence, doing the thing right. Uh, this is one of the examples of the of the session. So it's focused on transient ischemic attack, which is a part of the acute acute care or management. All these sessions for all the topics are, are they've got same same structure. So starting with case reports, usually a patient who is on the ward, we just pick it up. Everybody knows about about the patient, so we're just presenting the case report and illustrating the the management uh, with the guidelines, current guidelines. Um, what happened, diagnostic and all, all other things. And we are always finishing with shared decision making because this is important for us and for the doctors. So as you can see, we are uh, implementing different type of guidelines from, from around the world. So not only, this is in the UK, so we are not implementing only the NICE guidelines. Uh, we are talking about European Stroke Organization guidelines and Australian guidelines and others if they are available. Uh, starting always with the case report, Somebody is there on the ward, so illustrating what, what happened. Uh, a little bit of classifications and, and uh, symptoms. We are talking about what we are doing currently in the clinical practice, so we can just compare it to the guidelines later, later on. Uh, are we doing things wrong or, or right? What, what are we doing and what shall we, what shall we change? Um, shall we do something, something differently? So... <coughs> Differential diagnosis is very, very important because not, not every single uh, weakness in the arm or leg is, is a stroke, so we need, to, we need to be aware. We are learning from history as well, so uh, our doctors and healthcare professionals need to know what was going on in the past so they can compare it. Uh, old CTs in 1970s, old MRIs in 1980s. And then this is the most important, most important uh, part. This is the, the slide from the teaching. So guidelines, guidelines, guidelines is there. So they, they, see, they see these um, slides every single week on Tuesday. Guidelines, guidelines, guidelines. And everybody knows about Guidelines International Network. So they can go and see the library because they know about it. They have to. So diagnosis, for example. So we are using NICE guidelines uh, all up to date. And we are sometimes comparing guidelines. So NICE guidelines in the UK, so this is TIA, saying uh, patients need to be seen within 24 hours of onset of symptoms. Fine. Australian guidelines saying patients need to be seen, fine, but everything needs to, should be completed within 24 hours. So seen and completed. So usually we tend to aim for better. So as soon as they see these, they say, okay, fine, we need to speed up. Okay, time is brain. So let's let's do it. Let's do it faster. So just talking about it. Uh, guidelines from Royal College of Physicians. Nice. If there are any guidelines uh, published in other journals, we we go for it. Uh, European Stroke Organization guidelines 2021, 2022. Uh, American Heart Association as well, and the Living Guidelines. I don't know to say it's the best, but <coughs> we we use it quite often. Um, the graphics are, are quite, uh, as Nicola, Nicola showed, the graphics are quite, quite important. So I'm showing these, these uh, pictures to my patients because it's better for, for we call it shared decision making, but it makes sense. So it's, it's important. So we are using different, different tools from the guidelines and we are developing our, our own um, quick, quick tools, um, how to explain patients uh, what to do mantra again <laughs> and the last thing is evaluation and implementation so uh, just to mention we've got uh, again shared global project uh, run from from Brno from our center uh, with the GBI and Allied um, it's evidence-based implementation training training program in uh, focusing in uh, basically clinical audits and implementing implementing science or implementation science So I hope it made sense why we want to sing three males in one hit, not killing any animals. So we are just aiming for, for efficiency in guidelines development and implementation and evaluation. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Radim, for excellent presentation. And uh, we have a uh, time for one or two short Q&A, and I see some people are moving to microphones, maybe not to microphones. Yeah, we have there one. So please introduce yourself. Hi there, I'm Ina from Germany, from the Association of Scientific Medical Societies. You just cited one of our previous evidence schemes. And I was just wondering, how did you manage to translate the older evidence schemes, um, which are coming from a different perspective, like the Oxford or the AWMF scheme, into great because many data are missing. So um, in some guideline development groups really struggle. Do we have to redo all the work? Can we use the risk of bias assessment that has been done with Oxford? But what about the other criteria that need to be adhered to? So how did you do that? Well, pra practically, uh, I was very lucky again. So uh, the European Society of Cardiology guidelines are were quite clear. So what what, what we what we um, decided to adopt was quite quite easy to do. Uh, the nice guidelines as well because they they do they use uh, great methodology. So it's everything was there in the um, in the summaries of evidence and the tables of evidences. So it was easy to do because just reading through and putting together and then decide whether would, which one of these four are, is more appropriate. Uh, I don't have experience with the, with the other guidelines, with the other institutions, uh, but Miloslav, you've got more, more experience with the other institutions. Yeah, I'm about to react to it. Uh, I have a presentation of this tomorrow, so you're welcome to, to join and I will you know, speak more about you know, how we do it and, and what's, what's the part of the, of the methodology. There are two ways, right? One is the visual transformation, and then the second one is really to regrade everything, right? So that's two different things, and yeah, I, will, I will be speaking about this more, but it will be at least for 15 minutes. You don't have time for it now, but yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, you're welcome to join tomorrow. Uh, anyone else with the quick question? And it seems not, so I think we can invite another speaker. Um, just wanted to confirm, yes, good, um, okay, very good. Um, so our next speaker is um, online and doing it virtually, and it's uh, Jun Shia, and uh, she's director at the University of Nottingham. Um, she's also um, the co-director of the GRADE Center, also in Nottingham, and founding member of the China Clinical Practice Guideline Alliance, uh, with the acronym of GUIDANCE. Um, June has been an active reviewer editor in Cochrane. Uh, she works across cultures, continents, and stakeholders in order to promote evidence-based practice, and particularly in guideline development and implementation. So thank you, go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Milo Slav. Um, can I guess everybody can hear me. We did a testing um, just now. So, uh, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is June, and uh, I'm from the Nottingham Great Center and also from Guidance. Um, I had to do this session online. I am uh, very um, upset that I couldn't go, uh, despite that we um, started processing these applications things seven weeks ago. But hopefully, better luck next year. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the scientific uh, committee and the, the conference. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Hover Schunemann, for giving me this opportunity to do this uh, presentation to share my experience of um, uh, improving efficiency in guideline development in uh, resource limited settings. And I would also like to thank the organizing uh, team behind the scene for helping me with all the applications and arrangements and, and to make this uh, presentation smoothly happen today. Okay, so the topic I brought to you today is the evolving landscape of guideline development in China. And I'm just going to tell you a story, so sit back and relax. This is a story of innovation, and, but through the innovation to improve the uh, efficiency of guideline production, taking really a, a, a from a different angle to look at efficiency and how we improve efficiency other than through technology and methodology. Now, 
to begin this talk, I would like to invite you to take a brief trip down the memory lane to look through the lens of history and look at the healthcare reform of China. So, because this sets the scene for everything I'm about to tell you uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes. The healthcare reform went through state three stages between 49 to 78 and then 79 to 2002 and again uh, 2003 to today. So stage one in 1949 that's when the People's Republic of China was established and we had a central planned economy top down government led administration so that was just you know that the country just formed and the key word during this period 49 to 78 is shortage. We have a shortage of everything, healthcare professionals, shortage of drug, and there was very, very limited coverage of healthcare insurance. And there were a lot of um, barefoot doctors, um, like this gentleman you see down the bottom uh, right corner of the screen. They are mostly Chinese herbal medicine practitioners, traditional Chinese medicine practitioners, so we hardly had any. Um, uh, a trained, well-trained uh, Western medicine practitioners. Now, moving on to 79, that was the year before I was born. That was also the year the country decided that enough is enough. We need to um, uh, open up. We need to do better economically. So as a country, we decided to go through a, a reform economic reform. So 79, the, the reform initiated and that's um, parallel to that economic reform, we also went through political, administrative, and fiscal system reform. Now, in 79 to 2002, the country um, has seen a massive growth in economy. As a result of that, people's improvement, improved um, standard of living, quality of life, and we have seen rapid increase of healthcare capacity. And and a lot of privatization because that economic reform has allowed capital to come into the market and to set up private health care. Uh, medical expenditure rose uh, hugely during that time. Um, but um, that was a time that, that, that people are seeing better health care, seeing more resources, but we are reactive. We are mostly reactive to um, things that are happening, um, conditions that that's already occurred. So there was very limited awareness of, of prevention or public health. So as a, a, a consequence of that, the, the lack of input in public health and prevention, we had um, some public health emergencies such as SARS. Now, moving on to 2000, 2003 and onwards, um, that was the time that the country realized that, well, we have to do something to change that. Uh, we can't just treat, we have to prevent. So emphasize on treatment, um, switching more to emphasize on prevention and, and uh, looking after that previously uh, neglected uh, public health. And also this period focused on tackling the growth, uh, the growing inequality, uh, the equality in uh, uh, rich versus poor, and differential healthcare access between rural and urban residents. And also to really clarify that role of marketing um, and, and the government. Remember I said in the previous period, the market allowed capital to come in. So um, private hospital was set up and hospitals uh, therefore become market entities. They need to be self-reliant through market competition. So as a result of that, we had profit-driven um, healthcare. And, and then you have this debate of healthcare as a necessity versus healthcare as a commodity. And that increases, uh, obviously, the, the gap between the rich and poor and really does not help with e equality and access. So in 2009, uh, the government initiated a universal healthcare coverage uh, plan and the target is by 2020 the country is going to enter into a stage where everybody is covered uh, for their health insurance. Now um, as a part of that initiative uh, the government created the essential drug list scheme uh, to ensure accessibility to all and they encourage more privatization of the healthcare, encourage 
um, uh, hospitals and private healthcare services to become an integral part of the entire healthcare system to sort of uh, supplement the state-owned uh, hospitals and health services. So in 2012, for example, there were um, 9,786 private hospitals in China. And also the government invested heavily during that period of time on spending on drugs. Compared to 2009, by 2017, the drug spending as a country has doubled to two, uh, 268 billion US dollars. So we're seeing these rapid changes happening in a very short of the time. And you know, listening to this point, I don't know what feeling you get. We are we're busy, we're reacting, we, we hardly have time to think. So um, now as a but healthcare spending is a bottomless pitch, you can always spend more. And China has so many people, one sixth of the world population. There has to be something need to be done to cap that expenditure. And so in 2018, the government initiated this four plus seven drug uh, centralized drug procurement scheme. And that is the four cities uh, that you see on the right hand side of my screen, the four light purple municipal cities, Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, and uh, Chongqing. Uh, then forming a alliance with the other seven provincial cities to purchase as one unit. So before this four plus seven, each hospital, they make their own purchase. They decide what they need and who they buy that from at what price. But now the government is saying that now these 11 cities, all of the hospitals at these state owned hospitals are going to buy as one buyer. So suppliers um, or bidders, you have to cut your price down. As a result of this initiative, the average prices of generic drugs were uh, had a price cut of between 52 to 96 percent of the original marked price. So that has saved money for the healthcare system, and it has been cited as one of the um, early success for patient access in the uh, Chinese healthcare. Now, uh, so all of those were happening in the backdrop of the economic reform. So the healthcare system was responding to that economic development, to that change of people's standard of living, um, the changing health conditions come along with and as a result of that improvement in the standard of living and also in you know, the people's um, in change demand for healthcare. Now, what is happening in uh, to guideline in this context, in, in among uh, these busy activities. Well, let's have a look. Something's happening there too. Uh, there, there are some survey done by the Chinese researchers. Look at the graph to the left-hand side of the screen. In the most recent decade between 2010 and 20, there were 2,656, uh, sorry, 54 guidelines published across clinical specialty but over half of those, around 60% of those, were uh, without clear methodologies. So by that, um, well, the, the original author called these guidelines the consensus-based guideline. So what that means is that the um, top experts from tertiary hospitals in the wealthy first-tier cities got together and they've written up their experience based on the papers that they have read, and they published it as guidelines. Now, has that situation changed much? Uh, not really. Um, another research on the right hand side of my screen uh, done by a group of, uh, of Spanish researchers confirmed that picture that's still the case nowadays that only 10% of the uh, 573 guidelines that were surveyed, only 10% of those used great methodology. And that's what they claim to have used. We don't know how well they have applied it yet. And most of the guidelines produced are either adaptations of the uh, guidelines done by uh, the Western uh, medical societies published by developed countries, or they're formed by clinicians experience. So, um, so you know, guideline uh, producers are responding to that increase uh, in demand in, in the, the need for regulating the practice and people's demand for guidance. And what colleagues in the methods world have done some things to help with the situation, for example, that 
we uh, have written up papers on methods, uh, translated the great methodology papers and published them into Chinese and to improve access. We set up websites for uh, guideline registrations in hope of reducing research waste. Now, of course, these activities has helped a bit, but it hasn't made any fundamental change, judging by those numbers from the survey. Uh, well, you would question why, well, what, what, what is the cause of, of, of this situation? How can we address it? Partly, we are in this pickle because of lack of awareness of the advances in methodology. People who produce guideline, uh, they may be uh, very good in their clinical subjects, but they have limited awareness of what's happening in the methods world. Maybe they do not know. They're all uh, you know, these uh, better and more transparent, more reliable method to produce guideline. And, um, and, and, and also there's a lack of funding so who uh, publish guidelines in China is the medical societies. There is no central government um, budget to support this activity. And societies doesn't always have funding, sufficient funding anyway, to uh, support a properly produced guideline. So they are mostly produced by clinicians. And these guys are busy. They are clinicians by day and even in the evening, they have to change hats to become reviewers, a medical writer to write the guideline. So this situation is unsustainable and it does not help with producing uh, good quality guidelines efficiently. So there has to be something need to be done there to break this cycle. Now, we have to take a step back and to think innovatively, what, how can we turn this situation around to address it fundamentally? And, and for, it's from here that I began the innovative story, but that background was important because you can see that how that the healthcare system is changing rapidly and there's really little time for people to to, to think and plan, to refine things, we're just busy reacting. Also, the other important information from that background is the lack of infrastructure. We had no infrastructure to, to, to support this. Evidence-based decision-making, the application of evidence is a luxury in this resource-limited setting. We're just busy surviving. So moving on to this um, ideal situation. Now, wouldn't it be an ideal situation if the guideline commissioners were to work with a, a professional um, a team of reviewers and researchers to co-produce this guideline to do each does what they're good at. So if you look at the screen, the uh, blue circle here I have represents the guideline commissioners. So they are turned, they tend to be from uh, the Chinese Medical Association, the Chinese Medical Doctors Association, and occasionally um, they, um, the, the National Health Commission also issue guidelines. Now, we want them to work together with us, the research team, to co-produce better clinical practice guidelines and perhaps co-deliver trainings um, for future uh, guideline producers. Uh, now, if they agree to work together, we still have the issue of funding. Now, we need money to support those activities. Perhaps we can get the money from the uh, you know, public a uh, funded pathway, we can uh, run some trainings to generate our own funding, and uh, we can uh, call to the society for donations, and there's all these uh, potential channels we can get the money. However, I am not a fundraiser, I'm very shy to um, you know, ask for money. Why don't we leave that to the professional? So if we can find a group of people who's willing to do that fundraising for us, then we should have all that is needed to produce a, a self-sustainable, efficient system to produce guidelines efficiently in, in the system that everybody does what they are good at and what, what they are supposed to do, but not in silos, but collaboratively. So this is the idea that we've had, and, and we made that into guidance. So it's the China Clinical Practice Guideline Alliance, abbreviated as guidance, and this is um, our logo. 
guidance set up in 2001 in Beijing, and its purpose is to create a self-sustainable platform for multidisciplinary collaboration, which enables transparent, reliable, and efficient guideline development. And it adopts GRID as its principal methodology, and it is really the first of its kind in China as an innovative platform that produce a good quality guideline. Its establishment has attracted huge uh, attentions up and down the country. We had 23 media reporting the long traffic and 7 million viewings of the press release. And guidance currently have uh, 13 clinical specialties and for the interest of time that I will not read these um, out. And uh, it has three pillars in this the guideline commissioners, the two medical societies, you know, under each society, they have the sub uh, clinical specialty society. These guys commission guidelines. And we have the methodologist. There are four great centers in China. All are involved on this platform. Also, there's a Cochrane China network uh, involving um, uh, uh, nine affiliates, and they're all on this, um, uh, endorsing this initiative. And so that's Cochrane Central. Uh, Carla here today has very kindly supported us and great uh, partners globally, um, Holger Schunemann, for example. And now fundraising, we currently have three charities raising money for us. We have a service center that act as a project manager to you know, uh, glue everything together and look after the operations. Now this enable us to produce a very effective system where on the uh, left-hand side, the blue uh, block is the operation, um, uh, the interface, the, the, you know, the, the, the fundraising, the, um, uh, the guideline commissioning, and on the right-hand side, the, the red block is the, uh, the production, the, uh, you know, your searches, your evidence synthesis, um, and but the blue and red circle obviously work together to produce a guideline. Now, efficiency. Um, what, what is efficiency uh, in guideline production? You want to speed up, speed up the production. You want to improve the quality. You want to drive down the cost. Now, cost uh, to produce a good guideline it doesn't cost less than the traditional consensus. So there's no cost reduction in the short term. But if you look into the medium to, to the long term, it saves cost because the guidelines, you know, obviously it's easier to maintain and it's, it's more um, uh, implementable. So that then brings us to the topic of results. If your guideline is more um, uh, feasible, more relevant to the healthcare setting, then more people will use it and follow it. And hopefully that will improve practice and you know, save resources and improve people's lives. Now, for us to get more people to use it, to produce that results that we wanted to improve implementation, it's important that we engage government as a stakeholder because they have the, um, they have the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the power to, to reinforce this better than any of us could. So in, during the inception of guidance, we have informed National Health Commission that we're doing this, we're hoping uh, this will make, make, make a dent in improving the, uh, the quality of Chinese guidelines and producing our more relevant domestic guidelines. And they were very supportive. So as a pilot, in, they have agreed to, to co-publish these two guidelines on the board with us. Uh, so we, uh, we, we have their engagement and their endorsement. Um, well, we're also uh, looking into other means to speed up the process, to uh, drive down the cost. Uh, for example, conducting uh, a development of other good quality guidelines produced by other societies working with uh, global partners. And this is an example of the European Commission guideline on breast cancer screening that we adopted with the the help of the European Commission uh, team and, uh, and Holger and Ignacio and Ray Zhang from the McMaster Center. We're very grateful for their support. And so uh, now coming to the closing of this talk, that the, the message is that when we think about uh, efficiency, improving efficiency, 
in a better, uh, relatively better established healthcare system, you may look to technology, methodology, or streamline the process. But if you are a developing economy and those infrastructure are not there to begin with, and there's no strong desire for people to adopt it, then you have to think innovatively. And I hope that um, our experience here with guidance uh, will um, inspire you um, to think of something creatively to resolve the challenge in your healthcare system. And the locals here are collaborators and um, and 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 the stakeholders. So, and the key message is to to collaborate to. Uh, encourage that multidisciplinary, perhaps cross-industry collaboration uh, to improve efficiency. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Jun, thank you so much. It was nice and clear, and we heard you really well. Um, any questions from the audience for Jun in the next... We have one or two questions for an opportunity. Okay, so we'll leave the questions till the end. Very good. And hopefully you're still there and, and we'll stay on. I will. Excellent. Thank you very much. And now it's my uh, pleasure to invite to uh, the podium uh, Professor Lisa Askey. Uh, uh, Lisa Eski joined WHO at Geneva headquarters in 2020 as a scientist and methods uh, lead within the quality norms and standard department in science division. Uh, prior to her WHO appointment, Lisa led a large team at the NHMRC Clinical Trials Center, University of Sydney, which managed the Australian New Zealand clinical trials. And she was also involved in health technology assessment uh, for the Australian government. So Lisa, stage is yours. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak at this conference. It's, it is a bit nerve-wracking to be in front of a group again, but um, hopefully we'll, we'll do our best. Um, uh, the, as far as disclosures just go, I have uh, nothing to disclose. I'm a staff, uh, uh, I'm on the staff of the World Health Organization. Um, I'm going to talk about um, not only guidelines, but many of the other, uh, what we call at WHO, normative and standard setting products uh, in terms of innovation and uh, efficiency of development. Um, WHO has as its central role uh, a normative function, um, assisting countries to know what to do and how to do things to improve healthcare. And all of that, uh, you know, is generally has been in, a, in paper formats, but lately we're doing a lot more in terms of electronic and other innovative ways to, to disseminate um, those normative statements. But underpinning it all is driving impact in countries. So we keep that in the back of our minds. Um, it seems a bit of a theme today, but there is a bit of a history lesson, a little bit here too. Um, because uh, uh, those of us, uh, uh, or you know, people will know that uh, this rather scathing review by Andy Oxman, John Labus and others in 2007 suggested that, um, or not suggested, um, uh, summarised the fact that uh, up until that time uh, much of WHO's evidence, uh, uh, some you know, normative statements were not, were really what was described as gobsack, good old boys sitting around a table. Uh, in that uh, systematic reviews were rarely used, or some of your findings, there was a heavy reliance on the experts and little attention to the methods and the dissemination and the implementation. To its credit, WHO took that criticism um, and acted upon it. And since 2007, uh, we've had a, quite a rigorous guideline development pro process. I'm not going to go through this because this is very familiar to this audience and uh, many in the audience are the, are the are the inventors of this process. So um, there is a rigorous uh, process that can take usually between six and 12 months with approval steps and, and the explicit use of um, evidence and, and the grade methodology underpinning it. That is now part of standard WHO guideline development. Um, just to summarize the key parts of that, it is a system of checks and balances. We do pay particular attention 
to gender, geography, um, and other and discipline um, diversity in the in the input we get, and those roles are clearly delineated. The important group on that slide is the guideline development group, known as the GDG. Uh, they're independent experts, usually in both um, both technical and methodological expertise that act, act in their own individual capacity, not as a representative of an organisation. Um, and they are the ones that uh, finalise the scope, the key questions, and actually formulate the recommendations. They're supported by several other groups, as you see on that screen, both internally, uh, WHO teams, and an external review group at the end that, that uh, makes final um, kind of peer review of the recommendations. And importantly for this group, a, a, a team of uh, both systematic reviewers who, who help generate the evidence, uh, technical resource people as needed, and importantly, uh, methodological experts in grade and other methodologies. And the purpose of that is to make, ensure we minimise bias, maximise transparency and usability. Uh, and I won't go much into this slide because this is very familiar to this audience, using grade, um, being explicit and transparent, and, uh, and ending up with recommendations that, that fulfil best practice standards. And since 2014, uh, at least, and probably before that in, in different formats, we've had a well articulated and well used and publicly available uh, handbook on, on, on all of those processes and the different roles. So in that it also does, uh, and this is all pre-pandemic, so it's not something that we only discovered in the pandemic, uh, that we have different types of guidelines. So that full process that I just described is what we would call a standard guideline, but we have, at least since 2014 and probably before, have actually have a processes that, where we can compress and abbreviate that in response to a public health emergency with a time frame of needing guidance within um, um, a few months. As you can imagine, that, that process is well used during the, the, the recent uh, years. We also even have even more um, abbreviated processes when we need very, very um, urgent guidance, uh, which we call emergency interim guidance, that needs to be developed within days or weeks. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a narrow scope, short shelf life, and uh, we need to then do re often rely on expert guidance or expert opinion, existing other existing guidelines and indirect evidence. And that sh can take, uh, potentially can be developed within days to weeks. We have done that not only for COVID, but I've been involved just in recent weeks in the, in the monkeypox response. And uh, those, both of those types of uh, rapid guidelines uh, have been and uh, continue to be used. This standard process, um, of course, as everyone in this audience knows, it's trustworthy and it does take a long time. This is just one example. I'm not pointing out this one as anything in, out of the ordinary. This is a very typical WHO guideline that can take you know, often a year or more, and very often uh, we don't update them very often. And as you know, and everyone, and those who created these lovely graphs are in the audience, um, uh, we, we, we know that guidelines get, uh, that recommendations within the guidelines get progressively outdated, and we usually wait till most of them are out to date and, and, and uh, update the entire guideline in another gargantuan process. Um, but, uh, it, it, from 2017, so that's all worked quite well. It's very trustworthy, it's very rigorous, um, and, and, and meets best practice standards. But in 2017, the new Director General, or the DG, we call him Dr. Tedros, uh, came into office and he commenced what he called the WHO's transformation process. WHO was going to be transformed under his leadership in, in a lot of ways. But in particular, uh, he wanted us to look at the, uh, the way we, uh, our normative function and how we produce those normative statements. And there was an external review done, published in July 2017, that said uh, things that, again, I think reiterating what many of the other speakers have said, both this afternoon and this morning, that what we really needed is fewer products, but uh, more impactful ones. Uh, we need to prioritise those products. We used to call them global public health goods, GPHGs, but now they're called technical products. 
Uh, that report also recommended that we introduce quality assurance for all WHO normative and standard setting products and that the, those products focus on impact, not just an endless production of the products, but impact on the ground, particularly in low and middle income countries. And that we should improve the translation, dissemination, adaption, monitoring and evaluation of those products. So that was a big call. <laughs> and, um, Operationalizing that, there was sort of three arms. One was uh, the, the, global, uh, the prioritization of those global, global goods, the implementation, development and implementation of a fit for purpose quality assurance um, system, and, and to have a whole department that, that owned that process and ran it. Uh, so to the first, we now have a process where these technical goods are prioritized. This is led by the director the Deputy Director General's Office, so it's, it's at, at the highest level of the organisation, is responsible for this. And uh, our department has also produced the um, Quality Assurance Companion recently. It's a process where there's input from the, what we call the three levels of WHO, which is not only at headquarters, but the regions and countries. And those uh, products on a two-year cycle are uh, prioritised and, and made, made known and, and there where the resources are expected to go uh, in the first instance. The, the quality assurance process uh, was uh, needed to, to ensure we had good processes um, with appropriate clearances, not too many, not too few, uh, that we use best available evidence to underpin all our normative and standard setting products, that they were presented in a way that was user friendly and could better use visuals, and uh, that we had impact in, in country. And to oversee all this, uh, there was a creation of some new, um, infra new departments, uh, a part of transformation created for the first time, believe it or not, a science division at WHO and a, a chief scientist. And in, within um, her remit is uh, the, this new quality assurance of norms and standards department. It did contain three, now contains three, um, uh, uh, departments that are, that are already, three teams that are already in existence for a long time, the officer of the publisher, the library and the governance and review unit, but it created three new um, departments, uh, the methods and standards department, which, which I'm part of, and two others about process efficiency and, and design for impact. Um, in, in terms of our unit, um, as I say, we report, we have a director, John Grove, who sadly is now about to um, depart to, uh, for, for a new role. Um, and then there are uh, four of us under the, uh, the unit head, Rocco Kim, uh, uh, three of which are at the conference, so please feel free, Pura Reiko Salon, who's here, and I know uh, Rebecca Thomas Bosco is here, and Christine Hallou is holding the fort for us at home. Sadly, we don't really have um, any other staff under us, but we do have um, 12 uh, at least 12 WHO consultants currently who assist us in, in implementing this work. So that was all, that's all great, that was moving along, and then of course along comes COVID, um, like everyone else, the great disruptor. I think it's fair to say that it helped speed up some of these transformation plans, but it did, I think, in fact, set back some. Um, one of the great things that happened as part of COVID was, and helping us in our efficiency and our guideline production and other normative and standard setting products was the creation uh, very early on of this COVID-19 research database that now has nearly 700,000 uh, records in it from the databases go down the page, that's just the top of them, um, where you, uh, that has been curated by WHO uh, Library. I just want to say, um, you know, particular uh, word of thanks to Thomas Allen, who sadly passed away um, a, a couple of weeks ago. He was instrumental in making that uh, a reality. Um, the other thing that happened early in the pandemic, and I inherited, uh, when I came to WHO was the, um, was the rapid review group. Um, so we really needed a rapid uh, way of getting evidence that underpinned, and sorry, that graphic has gone a little bit haywire in our, uh, on, the, on the slide, um, of, of, of finding, um, rapidly sourcing evidence from a wide range uh, to underpin the wide range of things that we had to output. This ranged from either, like media releases through to a full uh, living guideline and uh, it covered all the pillars, what we call the pillars in the emergency response, mass gatherings, 
uh, labs, uh, you name it. Uh, we, this group still continues today because we still have questions where the rapid advice and rapid evidence is needed. Um, it's only a small team, 3.6 full-time equivalents, but we have done the full range and can provide the full range of um, evidence review services. To date, we've produced more than 150 rapid reviews with that small, oops, with that small team. The other in, uh, innovation at WHO as part of the COVID response was the uh, establishment of the Publications Review Committee, who, try, who, who did an amazingly stellar job. This is a slightly old slide, but the numbers are, have continued on. Um, looking, trying to look at all uh, uh, WHO pub, um, products that uh, uh, were being uh, issued under the COVID response and to help ensure integration, alignment and coordination of those and, and, and to have appropriate um, processes for quick, uh, quick clearance. Uh, the other important innovation where we've worked uh, very closely with the group at McMaster in, in customising their existing um, recommendations repository for COVID-19 for, for use to uh, collate the WHO um, guideline, guidelines, sorry, the WHO recommendations and help us better track them. Uh, I think it is fair to say that it showed um, where there were gaps, both in, you can see there are some areas where there is probably too much guidance and, uh, well, maybe not too much, but a lot of guidance in, in other areas where it was lacking. And it's also, um, you know, made us think a little bit more about the, the types uh, of guidance that we're issuing, the kind of statements. So we're still working closely with um, the group at McMaster to, um, to help us use this in, in, a, in a way that will help improve our, our guideline development. I'm not going to talk much about living guidelines. I know there's, there's huge interest and lots of sessions here. Um, so, um, uh, and, and you know, I don't need to explain to this group what a living guideline is. I've had to explain to a lot of people at WHO what a living guideline is, but um, uh, uh, our, we have managed to, with particularly the uh, COVID therapeutics, to reduce, you know, this is our uh, star, star one, the Rendesivir guideline that, that was produced with only within 36 days of, uh, of the uh, solidarity trial becoming available to us. So, um, but I, I, I think it would be remiss for this, to not say at this audience, <laughs> some of the things that we have had to do to make these living guidelines happen for, for COVID. Uh, we've really needed a lot of teams on basically on permanent standby. The amazing team at McMaster, I know Romina got her prize this morning and I can not thank them enough for the tireless work they've done to support um, uh, that work. There's a, a large team at the French Cochrane Centre that supported the vaccines, our own internal group, our own often uh, departments doing internal reviews and a huge range and, and variety and number of external systematic review teams in all sorts of areas that have been um, uh, absolutely fantastic in, in, in answering our call to help us. We've tried to coordinated that in a certain way with the uh, Evidence Collaborative for COVID-19, a group of more than 90 experts globally. We're still going to continue that on post-COVID, but we're thinking of how we're going to uh, uh, invigorate that for a post-COVID world. We've needed a lot of external methodology experts. Again, uh, we've needed internal people. We've needed external experts in other fields, and we've need to think about the way we do um, uh, standing groups that can help us uh, be called upon at short notice and there's, there's many, many now standing guideline development groups in all sorts of areas for COVID. It's also highlighted that we've needed to be quite close in this living ecosystem and having frequent contact with the different groups that I mentioned before, the review teams, the methodologists the, and other guideline developers and uh, for us uh, also industry, um, pre-qualification and uh, equity and access and pricing issues. It's blurred the lines a little bit of the way we had traditionally done that very firewall between those groups. Uh, but I think that's something that this community um, will, can help us with in terms of, of methodology going forward and, and how close is needed but not too close and still maintaining the, um, the independence of those different groups. Uh, we've really needed to, to rely on digitally structured data. So uh, the platforms have been mentioned uh, many times already in this uh, today, Magic App and Great Pro have really helped us being able to 
uh, both author and publish things in a digital format where individual recommendations can be updated rapidly. Um, we have had with our digital health team, uh, not part of my department, but uh, a lot of interface with this idea of smart guidelines, which I'll show in a minute. Um, and we have had, you know, this ability to publish this uh, just a few days ago, we published the 12th version of the, of the for instance, the COVID-19 therapeutics where we can link to particular single recommendations where we can, it's clearly flagged, you can click through the multiple layers, there's good version control, uh, summary of findings levels, etc. all there. So we've published it in that format as well as our traditional WHO PDF and we've worked with, in our case, the BMJ. Um, I know other publishers um, um, agree that a bit of healthy competition in how to produce these graphics is good. And we've also um, had a much more explicit and transparent process on what's coming through the, through the pipeline um, and that's been made publicly available uh, as well because that's the questions we get asked a lot, like what's, what's next on your assessment list. Uh, and the last thing here is just to say that all this is part of the base being, having a living approach and a digital curation of this data is the base for what we, what we also see as the future, this SMART guidelines, the acronym I can never remember, but it's basically that, that we, we need to um, digitise and make uh, you know, software executable and, and feed into decision support systems and AI, etc. Uh, so there's a lot of work in that space uh, at WHO. Um, just to finish, if I've got a little bit of time, I don't know how we're going, um, is, is, is to say what we're doing with our other norms and standard setting products, uh, which is the new frontier for us, because as I said, guidelines we've done pretty well, I think, uh, and, uh, and now we've got, um, we've really been charged with uh, ensuring the quality of the non-guideline products with this uh, new quality assurance uh, system with three pillars of standards, mechanisms and capacity and potentially we're piloting now this new uh, quality support panel idea similar in principle to the guideline review committee that's been in place for many years uh, but it'll, have to, it'll need a different format. There are many more non-guideline products um, but uh, the idea that they will all be quality assured um, is, is we're now piloting with a view to rolling that out across the organisation. To support all that, uh, we've needed, we have needed and will need an ongoing uh, a handbook, like a mega version of the, of the guideline development handbook for all these other uh, products. Um, and Pura Reka Salon has led the development of this. Um, so I'll let her answer any questions, should there be some. And, uh, but importantly that we've, uh, I think some of the most important work that she's led is this idea that we now are trying to have a taxonomy of all the different pro types of products we produce at WHO. We feel there's probably about six different types um, that, that are diff at different um, stages of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the normative and standard setting product pipeline. And these are just some examples of the, ty the different types of th things that WHO produces, glossaries, research agendas, strategies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, of which guidelines are one, but they are certainly not the only thing that we produce. So uh, having, um, having uh, a way of ensuring that all those products have the, the, their content, content development using best practice methods in terms of scoping, specifying evidence, formulating statements, maintaining them, is going to be a, a fairly gargantuan task for us. We're also going to be continually updating the methods handbook, um, part of the handbook that, that obviously has different methods cross-cutting, and we'll have checklists that, that WH, internal WHO people, we've got a generic one now, but we intend to do that uh, for all the specific things. The last couple of slides are just to say that we then do have these two other departments, process efficiency and design and impact, that are also working with us closely to make sure all this happens smoothly and that we can measure and, uh, uh, and, and in, in, you know, the impact, the uptake and feed that into the whole uh, evidence development system um, loop. There we, we already have well advanced and using piloting this new uh, WHO guides technical package that helps um, that work uh, happen in countries. 
So I'm going to finish with two slides to say that what I think we need and where this uh, network can really help us, I think it's the same types of things that have been said earlier, that we really need to focus on fewer products, uh, but they are more focused on the most impactful and prioritised ones. We clearly need to do this faster, uh, rapid, up-to-date living approach. They should be more fit for purpose, more user-friendly, implementable and have monitoring and evaluation. We need to be able to find them and use them uh, digitally and interoperably and ensure that they are fairly uh, more fair in terms of accessibility, adaptability and being able to be translated rapidly into other languages that we need. To do that, we really need uh, increased methods capacity, both internally and externally. We need better ways to improve the uh, adaption, adaptation and utilisation at country level. Uh, we need better feedback loops and metrics in terms of monitoring and evaluation. We certainly need to accelerate digitization uh, and we need to, whilst we have had great success, particularly in the COVID of specific living guidelines, trying to scale this up at an organisation-wide effort is going to uh, need a lot of uh, change at WHO in terms of processes, platforms, AI, etc. So I think I'll finish here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for a uh, very clear and excellent presentation. Do we have uh, specific questions for Lisa at the moment? And uh, then we will start a general, general discussion. And in the meantime, when you're thinking and maybe going to microphone, I have a, I have a question to Lisa. Uh, you, you mentioned several times very important transformations, what you do within the WHO and also digitalization. We were adapting several WHO guidelines within our national guideline program and what would help us a lot would be that uh, we for example have access to some um, to some of the finding tables uh, you're developing in the grade pro uh, or evidence to design for criteria have you think about to make this available accessible as well because then for someone who is adopting guidelines it will make our lives much more easier so it will be very effective and efficient yeah uh, absolutely it's Another thing on my to-do list <laughs> with my non-existent other stuff. But um, uh, yeah, we, we, we really need a, a good system of curation of, and sharing of all of this. Um, uh, we've done it somewhat uh, and certainly being in, in, the, in the digital platforms I talked about, they are accessible. Um, but uh, you're right, it would be much easier. We, we, we are talking about with um, CERN and others uh, to, to have a repository um, of where all this, this information could be had. But I think rather than us rush off and create something, we also need to think about this at a global scale. So I know we're having meetings with a few people at this meeting to see if we can, we can um, do that so that it's, there's less duplication and more sharing, for sure. I, uh, so I just wanted to, be, if anyone does have a question, um, but we, we do have an interesting uh, uh, representation from each of the groups about what is efficiency, and that's why I had Lisa put that last slide up, because it was fewer, faster, fit for purpose, findable, what was it? Fairer. Um, and I don't know if I saw finer, like a, a better quality or, um, and so I, I, I would like to hear from the, each of the, uh, each of you, cause you had, you know, Nicola, you had said about um, making sure that it was um, findable or usable or friendly. Um, so I think we, each of you could sort of discuss a little bit about where we're at and what needs to be better. Thank you for offering me <laughs> this simple equation. Um, no, I, I think uh, concentrating on hot topics and the COVID again is a beautiful example of a difficult task to be done rapidly. And um, I, I have to say, though I'm biased in favor of WHO, that this work has been done very well in terms of sending out proper, appropriate messages and, uh, 
and um, appropriate to the context. Um, difficult press releases, overemphasis by, by the media and, and so forth. So another element is that probably different topics uh, differ in terms of the audience um, waiting for them. So there are groups much uh, variably organized or that uh, take into account um, either a common culture or, or a common vision. So for sure oncology, HIV, cardiology are much more used to sort of TB, chronic conditions where they wait for the update to, to, to change the protocols. Other areas, uh, rapidly evolving, typically in, in emergency, um, are much more difficult and, um, yeah, and um, probably we should all, as we were requesting WHO, please give us more. I think we should try to give to WHO a little bit of our energies. <laughs> That's my view. Very good. So, would you like to add something, Lisa? Or? Uh, well, I, I should add another F. I, I'm, uh, some people don't like the F word, so we, maybe we can have a series of S words. Or something. I don't know. Um, but um, I, I, did, I didn't put in shorter, but I think uh, uh, just the way we present guidelines, you know, there is some criticism that we, we, don't have a, we don't have a template. Everyone produces a different one in a different way, where to find the information, etc. So I think sh shorter summaries, like 21st century formats, I think we, we, we really need to get there quickly. And so, so I'll, I'll add another F for Fina, maybe. I don't know. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. We have a question from audience. So please, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, Murad Alam from Chicago. I had a question for our um, presenter from uh, who's in China at present um, regarding the funding of guidance and you indicated that there are a number of different groups that can funnel money into supporting that if I understood correctly and I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit as to how you if there are even commercial entities and a whole range of other donors how do you manage conflicts of interest with regard to the funders and how do you maintain arm's length Thank you for that question. Yes, we have thought long and hard about that. How do we do we accept uh, money from industry? I think that's the concern and that's the elephant in the room that everybody was concerned about. And that's uh, that's the thing. That's the question that we got grilled uh, on when we approached to invite these partners to join us to try to convince them this is a good idea. Um, so the short answer is yes, we take uh, donations from any anybody, any organization that includes pharmaceutical uh, industry, but uh, the key here is the insulation. Is that's why we have this uh, funding management totally separate from the the production. So if um, and it doesn't, it, it, it this doesn't just apply to the industry. It applies to any donor, whether you're a private donor, you are you know industry donor. You can donate money for. Uh, for the cause, but you cannot donate any projects. And uh, for the production team and the, the guideline commissioners, we do not uh, have anything to do with the management, with the fundraising, the fund allocation, and we, in a way we, we are totally insulated from that. So the, uh, I suppose the effect that we're achieving here is that we have this mixed pot of money that could come from everywhere. Uh, you know, it could be from an individual or it could be from um, a company that produces dermatology drugs, but it could be funding a, a guideline in, uh, uh, in uh, schizophrenia. So that's how we manage it. Uh, thank you. And we have another question from audience. Yes, thank you. First, uh, I'm Mary Nix from AHRQ in the USA. First, Professor Askey, I, I just want to express my condolences for the loss of your beloved colleague. Uh, some of us know what it's like to lose a trusted coworker. Um, and so I wanted you to hear that from me. Um, my question about efficiency and guideline development as you transform, innovate, um, 
sink nails, um, and so on. How are you measuring this change in efficiency among your different programs? What is your, we heard from Dr. Marmot this morning about the importance of data. So what was your baseline data? Your use cases and stories were fantastic. But when you have to go back and show how all this change that you did has been beneficial, what are, what are your measures of pre and post and what, what are you expecting? Thank you. Do you want me to go first? Um, that's a, that, that is a great question. Um, uh, we are measuring, uh, at this stage we're measuring very basic things uh, in terms of baseline, you know, how long things have taken, you know, how many times they went back for review. So, so they're, they're the simple thing, well, fairly simple things. Um, and that's what that, that whole process efficiency unit is also helping us uh, with. But the more difficult, which I think is what you're alluding to, uh, the more difficult measure is how to measure impact. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I had this, like, to be honest, I've had the same conversations when we set up the, all the trial registries. You know, it was like, well, it seems like a sensible thing to do, but how do you, how do you, how do you measure the impact of trial registration on, on you know, trustworthiness of whatever? Um, so uh, I don't think, I mean, I have had some preliminary conversations with quite a few people in, in this room about um, what that looks like, but I'd be, I would actually be very interested to know what people think we should be measuring um, because it is, uh, it is what, what we say we're going to do, improve the impact in, in country. I, I mean, I think very important, I didn't show it on a slide, but you know, it's this, this feedback loop, you know, it's, people describe line, guideline development as a sort of a linear process where we all know it should be a feedback loop and it's this bit that's all, often missing, where that feedback from country impact. Uh, we have set up um, a very good, well, in my view, a, a good, a much better system, again, uh, Pura, who's in the audience, has been leading that, of, of uh, regional uh, country represent regional representatives who have been like invaluable to helping us sort of start to think about those impact um, measures. Um, but I'd be I'd be really happy to talk to people about what because I, I I don't have the simple answer to that. Uh, it's it's the magic the magic number that we need or magic thing we need to measure. I think oh, sorry, it's a WHO thing. You say over at the end of everything. Uh, measuring is, uh, in, in my field, for example, the stroke medicine, uh, it's heavily audited, so every, every single step we are doing from the beginning to the end is, is audited, so we are doing audits or clinical audits, even on a local or national level, uh, before something is implemented, then after it's implemented, we do re-audit, so we know exactly uh, the impact of the new uh, guidelines or recommendations. Um, then uh, there are international and national registries of uh, quality measures. So you can, you can see and compare the different types of uh, quality measures before and after any recommendation is updated or, um, or implemented. Uh, and within our national guidelines program, we do uh, epidemiological analysis from the national registries. Uh, from healthcare providers and, and other registries. So we know exactly if we implement um, a guideline on something. So we, we see whether um, the increase in uh, specific population of using of the procedure or medication or something has increased or decreased and so we can see the movement. So we are comparing the, the epidemiological data before and after implementation of the guidelines on the national level. So, clinical audit. Another question? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Rich Rosenfeld, American Academy of Laryngology. Uh, I want to tie this panel into the first one, uh, efficiency and equity, because they seem to push against each other. So if you want to be efficient, you want to minimize waste, you want to get the best outcome with the least effort and energy. But when you put a layer of equity on it, 
and thinking about that equity matrix and all the different social determinants and, and the myriad of different people you need to engage and the way a given recommendation can apply in so many different ways depending on the population, it seems like it's almost cursing us when we try and put the equity on top of the efficiency. So how do you stay efficient and be equitable? <laughs> I can have a first stab at it. Um, uh, well, I mean, I, I would argue that you, you know, eff efficiency also means reducing waste. So if we're, if we, if we're producing guide, you know, if we're producing from WHO's point of view, if we're producing guidelines that that users don't just put on the shelf and don't use, uh, you know that that's not efficient. It, it might be easier to do it that way, but it's not efficient. So, um, you know, uh, the, the investment is a longer-term investment. It's a longer-term investment, and, and and COVID actually showed us that. Um, you know, we 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 always have um, a rep well since 2000. And Four, seven, we've had representatives f uh, of, of the affected communities on our guideline development panels, but you know we've really ramped that up with uh, some of the COVID, the COVID work, and particularly having um, uh, direct, you know, uh, feedback from countries has been has made that that process just so much more efficient in terms of, um, you know, which drugs get prioritised, which outcomes are meaningful. The, the whole EDT, EDT discussions. Um, so I think you can you can use you can have equitable and efficient guidelines, but it's a longer term gain. It's a longer term gain. Um, I would say that they are not fighting each other, I, I, and it was good to start with a broader view. I think uh, efficiency and methodology. Uh, for the validity of the guidelines and equity as to deal with the implementation phase and local context. Um, so, um, yeah, that's my view. Can I add something to that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I think that um, that's, uh, we're getting into quite a philosophical de debate again, as, as I said in the presentation, healthcare as a commodity versus healthcare as a necessity. So in a country like China, uh, I, I guess like many other developing economy, we're facing very similar problem of this uh, gap in, in access, rich and poor, rural and urban, and uh, you know, vast majority of China um, live still um, in very resource limited settings. Uh, I, 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 from a guideline development point of view, I see uh, efficiency and um, equity as having a synergy. So by using guidance as an example, that by creating the system that helps guideline commissioners to more efficiently uh, produce more relevant and more uh, uh, guidelines with better um, uh, external applicability, more people using it, you increase efficiency, reduce waste, like all the other, um, uh, several other uh, panel members uh, have uh, emphasized. But in, in, in the process of doing that, um, you kind of incorporate the um, uh, the, the elements of um, uh, the different needs from different social groups, you know, you incorporate that into your, into your, uh, your, your guideline recommendation. So I see a synergy there. Yeah, very good. And we have another question from audience, Josef. Thank you. Hello, Josef from Slovakia, recently also from PBAC and uh, member of executive board of WHO. Thank you very much for uh, all the lectures and I have two questions. The first one is, um, I think that we have a very good opportunity to learn from COVID. Uh, each of us, we uh, tackle it from different point of views. And very recently, this global community has uh, some speci special and specific knowledge and experience how to perhaps deal with it. We know that on global level, there are more um, rising initiatives like uh, the pandemic treaty or INB initiative at WHO and so on. So in, it's a great opportunity perhaps to incorporate some recommendations for the countries to prevent 
uh, in preparedness to prevent such, such a chaotic measurement and also clinical, let's say, guidelines development because we know that in different countries it was, um, it was addressed differently. Some um, countries, they used political voice and it was not really appropriately evidence-based and also um, uh, the specific teams uh, hasn't been established. In some countries, they had been entitled groups of professionals and a couple of methodologies like the advisors for a certain period of time and in some countries, it's like ongoing process. What we can do perhaps from your perspective as um, uh, as the speakers, uh, how we can address uh, and prevent uh, these emerging needs in the future to create more sustainable, more efficient and uh, more reliable groups of, uh, of uh, panels of guidelines developers in ways of emerging uh, needs. So this is the first task. I, I know that is perhaps uh, wide, but uh, you can perhaps address two or three your points of what you would recommend for the countries or uh, from global perspective, whether to develop a handbook or guidelines, uh, policy makers and politicians, but also um, professional societies can follow. And the second one is we had discussion, a lot of discussion has been going on regarding to some recommendations, for example, ivermectin. It was mentioned also in guidelines of WHO at the McMaster University. It was really a lot of discussion about this. They are perhaps sort of uh, the research recommendations yeah, and how we can perhaps deal with this in the future because many countries and efficiency, as you have mentioned, is also about reducing waste and a proper investment. Many countries, they even establish formal recommendations. It should be somehow addressed by research, but nothing has been happened because it was not in written, it was not announced. So how we can perhaps uh, from governing bodies and from perhaps also the WHO perspective address it in more effective way um, uh, for the future. Thank you. I think that your uh, comments and questions actually probably cover <laughs> quite a bit. Um, and it's four o'clock, so I'm thinking on that note we might uh, finish because those are huge questions, I think. Um, so maybe we can talk about that during the uh, break. Um, and so again, I'll thank all of our speakers um, very much for a good afternoon. Thanks. Thank